actually excited for this one because I'm going to be talking about something that I initially didn't really want to talk about just because uh, I I just didn't I I wanted to save it to be a special episode uh, and the the reason I wanted to save it to be a special episode is because it's one of my favorite ways of fishing in general it's one of my favorite ways to fish uh, and we're going to be discussing pencil popping for striped bass uh, and I I've kind of glanced over this a few times in past episodes but I really want to go in depth and I was very very successful this season on catching some of my best fish of the season on pencils uh which I'm super you know it's probably my favorite way to catch striped bass uh and I mean I don't think there's a more exciting way than watching a big bass leap out of the water or just breach on a big plug or not a big plug, but just a top water plug in general and watching it wake up on it and swirl on it. And then finally just roll up on it. Cause it's a big fish. So it just does this beautiful roll onto the, onto the plug. It's just really a fun thing to, to do to a fun way to fish. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. So I, I wanted to kind of talk about, and I've, I've discussed this in past podcasts, but I'm going to tell a few stories that kind of will link into the whole pencil popping deal. And, uh, from this season, I, I really had one day that sticks out in my mind from last season. And that was, I, it had to be, uh, mid August, mid to late August. It was after I had some good blitzes going on and I knew there were some big fish around in the area. Uh, I was consist- consistently connecting with some of the larger bass of my season, uh, that whole week leading up to it. Uh, the bass were definitely there in, in good numbers. And it was one of those things where everybody was being weirdly quiet uh, in my area, which is, is funny because normally everybody's pretty, uh, likes to likes to share what's going on. But everybody, all the people I knew were being weirdly quiet. And it was for good reason because everybody was catching lots of big bass and everybody was being weirdly quiet. And uh, I was super, I was one of those people that really did well, better than I have in almost any other season, uh, especially on top water. But oh my God, I had a few days where it was some of the best fishing I've ever had, period, hands down. I mean, it was so, uh, it, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard to describe because when you have bass that are coming up on the surface and crushing plugs uh, and doing it in, in ways that you would think that they should be 15 to 20 inches long, not 40 to 48 inches long. And that's what I was getting into. And this, I I have a few different scenarios where this really, uh, the fishing was just electric, but there's many different ways that you can fish pencil poppers. Uh, my favorite way to fish pencil poppers, my favorite time to fish pencil poppers is it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, it's kind of hard to pick. I mean, I, I wanted to say just then in, this is what's going through my mind. I'm like, oh, is it calm water? Is it when it's really calm out and you can see everything going down, you can really hear it and it's like pretty crazy. Or is it when it's just pouring rain, you got some big surf and you're working this pencil and then the, it just explodes on it. Like what is, I'm trying to think in my mind, like is, what is my, what is the most favorite for me? And uh, I mean, calm water is hard to beat when you have, it's just so dramatic when the water is really flat, calm. So I might have to say that calm water is my favorite, but I really think that you get like the feels and you're like, wow, I'm like a true surf caster when you're in the elements and the waves are crushing, you know, crushing down on you and you're, you're pulling some, some big fish out of the, out of the water on top. And it's just, oh, it's just pretty electric, especially when that happens. You're definitely feeling like, you know, you're vibing with the whole, the whole experience uh, in, in those, those times. And I I definitely want to get into a story, but back to what I was talking about. So it was August. Everybody was being weirdly quiet. The fishing was really good. There's a lot of really big fish around and it didn't matter where you were. You could be off the rocks. They're off the rocks. You could be on the beaches. They're on the beaches. I mean, there was just a lot of really big fish around and, uh, the, the bait was getting, and this was towards the end of like what I would, yeah, I mean, it was towards the end of the season when you definitely are getting those bigger schools of fish that are moving around. And I honestly believe that it was probably the majority of the big bass that we had on Cape Ann just got up and left. Uh, and it's funny to kind of describe it like that, but it was pretty much like that. And I definitely talked about that last podcast where we went from pretty good fishing to very bad fishing really quick. 
And so uh, this day in particular, uh, I didn't have a, a lot of time because I was actually, I, in theory, I didn't have a lot of time. I canceled everything that was going on once I started to see what was going down with the fishing. But uh, I didn't have a lot of time and it was good conditions. I looked at the thing. I was like, man, I got an hour. So I went to my one of my favorite topwater spots and it's on, it's kind of on a point uh, and the current comes around the point and it kind of, you know, juts out a little bit. And uh, it was, it wasn't like wavy, but it, it, like, it wasn't really wavy. It was a little choppy, but it was pretty calm. I mean, it was a little, it was, but it was a little bit choppy. It wasn't too bad though. And uh, what happened was I, I cast it out you know, first cast and I'm working in my pencil and I see some swirling coming behind my, my plug. And I'm like, okay, there's a big fish behind that. And then all of a sudden I had four bass that were all 45 to 48 inches start coming out of the water and they knocked the plug. And once one knocked the plug, another one, like a, I don't even know how to describe almost like a dolphin would jump over the back of another one and missed and another one jumped over the back and another one jumped over the back. And then I happened to hook into one of the biggest ones and it was on this exact plug. I've since retired this pencil. Um, that's why the hooks are still rusted on it, but it was on this exact plug. And when I tell you that this was gone, I mean, I'm talking about it got sucked so far into the fish's mouth. Like it was, it was right. It was hooked probably a quarter of an inch above its like stomach. It was not like swallowed, but it was very close. It absolutely inhaled the plug and uh for that reason it actually didn't fight very hard uh i i really got it up and turned it i was a little worried that it might be able to chafe my leader i was able to get that fish in quick and i knew uh i knew that it was going to be a ridiculous day when you have that many big bass come out of the water on a plug i mean you know that it's going to be pretty nuts and that's what uh what happened. So I hook into this fish. It kind of does, you know, the big head shakes and it does a short few pretty short runs, but it wasn't like, it was more like you're fighting the weight of the fish rather than really fighting the full power of it. So I was fighting a lot of the weight of the fish and I used kind of a wave to my advantage and I kind of slung it up into a tide pool and I was able to quickly, you know, go unhook it and get it back in the water. I think I, I don't even know if I got a picture of it, of this fish. My camera is in my bag and I knew that I was going to catch more bass. There's just, it was too quick and there's too many other big bass out there. Uh, I knew that, you know, there was a, there's a big school sitting in this current line and I knew that they were going to be just picking apart, you know, the bunker that was out there. So I, I get back up onto the rock that I was fishing off of next cast. Boom. I cast out there working it. It was like instant. I mean, I probably twitched their tip my rod two or three times and another monster bass just did this full big, you know, and I, I, ca I call it like the big bass breach. I've used that terminology before when you have this really big bass and it kind of goes sideways up and kind of just inhales the plug. It kind of almost hits the top of the plug. If you can imagine the bass coming up and then it just crushes the top of the plug. Um, and that one got hooked kind of on the outside of the face and it, that, that was a very tough run. And, you know, I fought that fish really hard. My drag was screaming and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is even bigger bass. I'm working it in. I'm working it in. It's screaming. I finally get the bass up and get it in and I take a picture of it. It's a crappy picture of the fish, but it was mid 30 pound bass. It was probably 34 pounds. I mean, it was, it was a very solid bass. Um, and uh, I got that fish in. I took a really quick picture of it. I I probably won't be able to put it in, but um, it was not a very good picture. I think I might've posted it on my Instagram. It's, it's, it was not a bad, it was a pretty bad picture. I kind of had my hand flat on it and it was just, it was out of focus. It was all blown out. I, I didn't really even mess with my camera settings. And this was kind of the first day I was really wanting to mess around with a, um, like a, a DSLR style camera. And I hadn't really done that in game time scenarios. I was hoping that I could just get onto some schoolies and maybe I'd get one nice bass out of like, you know, if I get a few 25 inches and then maybe one 40 inch bass, then I would be able to kind of play around with the camera. But I was thrown into the deep end quite literally by some extraordinarily big fish. So I take one picture of that fish, I unhook it and I pitch it right back into the water. I mean, that thing couldn't have kicked off harder, just, you know, face full of water type deal. I mean, these bass were 
really energetic frothed up fish and you could tell that you know that time of year the water temps are starting to cool down a little bit and the bass were very very lively uh they weren't lackadaisical like they can be sometimes during the year i mean most of these bass besides the first one fought like you like crazy so i get back up on my rock i pitch out another cast i don't think i actually got a hit on that cast then i cast even further out there's some boulders a little further off um and I, I cast it out over the boulders. Uh, you can see a little bit of white water coming over the rock and I'm working it, I'm working it. And then boom, I get a fish that crushes it. And another like 45 inch bass. Uh, that one, I, I got a really good, um, I like I was, it was, I handled it well. I mean, I mean, the, the, the fish was big and I think I believe that I actually caught it on, um, I think it was actually this exact plug to be honest. But it was not, I generally am using a six inch pencil, but I think I actually switched to a bigger pencil because they're being so aggressive. I was like, oh, maybe I can actually throw a, uh, and I'm not even joking. I believe that this is the legitimate exact plug that I used to catch that fish on. Uh, and it was a really nice one. And uh, it was, I wanted to get a little better casting distance, which this medium size Pumba plug does really well. A little bit, it's a little bit better casting distance than like this, this, like five or six inch versions. Um, I believe this is a six inch yellow over white, which is kind of my favorite size. I, don't, I think it really mimics like that medium size, easy to eat bunker uh, very well. And I think that the bass really go after it. So I was using this a little bit bigger yellow over white and I'm a huge fan of yellow over white for um, striped bass in general, but especially with pencils. I mean, you can't really beat that. So anyway, so I was, I, I, launched that cast out i was twitching it i one didn't get it and then i i think i actually switched up the plug i threw out another cast and i'm working it in working it in, boom another really big blow up and obviously t big tail thrashes on the surface smacking the top of the water and then get some traction you know rods going rods going uh it's, it was just a really awesome fight got that one in that one was hooked a little bit better and i i was really able to get some good photos of that one um I was probably one of the smaller ones that I got that day. It was probably right on 45 inches. It was still a solid fish, but uh, it was one of the smaller ones of the day. And this continued. And one of the, the last fish that I caught, uh, I, I ended up switching around to the Magnum Walker and caught a few fish on that that were huge as well. But it was just those one-off, one-off fish. And this was for a whole tide. And it was funny because I... I, I was supposed to be back. And I was like, I'm not leaving this bite. This is like once in a lifetime type deal right now. Now, I hope I, I can experience that again, but oh my gosh, that was just some of the most insane topwater fishing I had in my whole life and that I've ever had before. So I really wanted to make sure I, I stuck until that bite ended. And I fished that whole side of the tide. Uh, I then threw this, uh, one out one of the last big fish i caught i threw this out it was at the very end of my cast and i just get this hit and all the other hits you know the bass comes up and grabs the plug and then you feel it you know the weight of the plug and then it goes this bass i hooked into and it pulled me almost off the rock it hooked into it and it was off to the races and it felt like the most like the heaviest weight of a fish that i've ever felt in my life and I mean, I'm talking about this fish felt like it was all of 50 pounds. I literally thought I hooked the biggest bass of my life. I I was fighting it, I think for legitimately, um, it had to have been like four minutes. I mean, and I fight my fish really hard. All these bass that prior that were up to 48 inches, I landed in under a minute. This bass I fought for four minutes because it hit at the, at the very end of my cast and it did an incredible run. And it was so much weight. It was just like, but it was fighting weird. And then halfway through the fight, I was like, there's no way this isn't like hooked in the side. Because if it was not hooked in the side, it would have to have been oh well into 50 pounds, if not over 50 pounds. I mean, it was so, it felt so big. And I've caught very large bass in the Cape Cod Canal before. And I rarely fished the canal, but the time that I did, I caught some really big fish and it fought 10 times harder than those fish. Uh, and you know, this bass was just so big and I was getting him up and I get him and I finally get him in. He's hooked right in the tail. I hooked a bass in the tail and uh, they were feeding so aggressively that this bass thrashed its tail at the plug and it hooked it into the tail, hooked the tail on the, uh, on the, the plug. So that means that 
striped bass do something very unique to uh, kind of stun and injure their prey. Uh, and one of the ways that they do that uh, is to whack it with their tail really hard. And that's what it did. And by whacking it with its tail, it ended up hooking into the tail of the bass. And it was it was a big, big run from uh, from that fish. And I was really quite shocked by by that in general. I, I really thought that it was like that it was the one, but I kind of wisened up as I was reeling in and I was like, there's no way this isn't hooked in the side. I mean, it's just too big to be, to be what it is. You know, it would have just been, it would have been ridiculous if that was actually what it was. And, uh, I finally was able to, um, get that bass up and in. And, uh, I was able, I released that one really quick. Cause I obviously had been reeling it by its tail and it, it kicked off really strong. Uh, but oh my God, that was one of the most ridiculous kind of calmer water days, but as much of, as much as it was like calm, it was also kind of in the middle. And what I mean by that is you have a little bit of chop, but you also have, um, a little bit, it's not like, it's not crazy. Cause I think what happened during that day as well is there's a pretty strong wind. And I think as the tide went, the wind was kind of, kind of switching more to the you know, around, like the, the, the wind was switching up more around. And I don't really want to say where the wind was blowing because I don't want to give away the spot, but the, uh, the wind was blowing and it, it turned the, the bite around a little bit. And I think it kind of blew out the fish a little bit and blew the, the rip that I was fishing off offshore a little bit out of my uh, casting range. And, uh, it was one of those deals where I was hooking all my fish at the very end of my cast. And that's something that is, is, tough when you hook a fish way out because then you're fighting it forever to get it in because especially with a pencil popper which is such an awesome casting plug i mean that's one of the best benefits out of the pencils uh is how far you can cast them and uh i i did really well and so that was like a choppy that was kind of in between it being like what i would consider rough water and what i would consider like calm water conditions there wasn't big surf but it was a little choppy out now the other scenario in which, uh, you know, you really do well is in calm water. And I kind of want to describe what I was looking for in that scenario to catch that bass on, on the pencil. And I, I want to do a separate video on exactly like the more advanced ways of how you work pencils and what I look for to cast them in certain different scenarios. So, uh, this bass in general, uh, came in the spot that I'm so I guess to backtrack here a little bit, I fish very primarily off the rocks of Cape Ann. Uh, and that's, it's like the rocks there. It's what I, I like to kind of say is it's pretty much a rocky coastline and it does a lot of this. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of little coves and little points and it's very, very fishy water. Like most of it has the potential on certain parts of the tide to hold big fish. And yeah, there's a lot of different factors that lead into there being a big fish there and why like if you, like in general, like there's people also ask me cause I'm doing some guiding this year as well. Why should I hire a guide in general? And what I always say is there's many factors that lead into catching big fish that's beyond the spot. So I could take you to a spot one day and that one day the bass will be there, but they might not be there they might be there maybe once a month and only for six, like a six hour span. That's the only time those bass will be there. So even if I brought you to where I was catching a lot of these big fish, even if I brought you to where I was catching these bass in general, unless you really fit all the little puzzle pieces together, you wouldn't have gotten that bite. And that's why to me, that was almost a once in a lifetime bite. Cause a lot of the stars aligned, the wind was good, the tide was good and the moon phase was there. And so, we had a bunch of stuff in my favor and one of them was the current and where the wind was blowing and how it affected that current off of, I guess, the point of that cove. So it wasn't a big cove, it was a little cove, but it sticks out a little bit and then goes back in. And uh, that sticking out is going to create a spot where either on an outgoing tide, the current's going to come up and hit that and speed up and shoot out. And the way you can see that is generally there's what we like to call like a, a bubble line or a current line. So there's a little bit of like bubbles that kind of bubble out and you'll kind of see that that's the line that the, the bass will be on. And that's the line that the current is going to kind of push on. And uh, that's how is probably my opinion, the easiest way to kind of gauge where the current is. And uh, 
I'm, I, I really like to look at that stuff because it, it shows me. And a lot of the spots that I fish, granted, don't have that much current. Like you could, you wouldn't really know even if you're swimming there. Like that's one of those deals. Like you could be swimming there and you wouldn't really know that there's current. Uh, but if there's some wave action, you'll definitely know there's current there because you can sit in that and you'll be shot out from that current. will just drag you out and blow you, you know, 10 miles away because the, there are certain places that have these rips that will just be sucking current. Uh, but that, those are on very specific tides and very specific moon phases where you have huge tides and they just bring the current through that area very quickly. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's very specific things, but generally on calm days, and I was very fortunate to be one of those people that was able to catch big fish and it didn't depend on the moon phase. And I could do it at 12 noon, it being not a cloud in the sky. And it was just because I was focusing on those little coves and those little current lines. Uh, and obviously there's something that kind of gave us a false sense of security, which would be the amount of adult bunker we had this past season. It was on a level that I've never seen personally. Uh, and it wasn't like you're seeing bunker show, but you would be able to see offshore there's birds working on bunker schools. And so generally what would happen is those bass would come in shore, they would nose up into current and they would just wait. And this was them in their digesting phase where they go into water temps that are more, the, that are the most, uh, I guess, what are they? I guess the most, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? But they're, anyway, they're like the best conditions for their digestive system or for them to really not have to work to keep themselves whatever it's you get what i'm trying to say they're just the best for them to digest pretty much uh there's a specific word that i was looking for that would really nail it on the head but i'm blanking here for some reason but anyway i hate when that happens um the bass like to nose up into this current and they just sit there and they use their big tails and they just hang out in the current and they wait and if there's a easy meal that goes blowing by them they're gonna of course go and smash it and then they'll come back and wait in the current and also if they get you know, a, a injured bait fish on the surface, they're going to see that and they're going to be up immediately and crushing it. So what happens is they wait in the current and what they like to do is they like to follow the current out and then they follow the current back in and they just hang out in that and they, they wait for bait fish and easy meals because they've been feeding on those bunker schools all day and they're, they're full of, full of bait and they don't really need, uh, they're not really looking for a hard meal because it's pretty difficult for a bass to run into a school bunker and grab one because if you think about it they just don't they don't swim there with their mouths open and grab a, a, a piece of bait they lock on to one bait and they go right for that one bait and they chase that one bait even if it gets broken off from the school they're going to chase that one specific bait away from the school they're not looking uh, at a massive ball of bait and uh, going and grabbing it. That's why when you see bass around bait schools, th they are, you know, cruising the outside line. And that's because they're trying to pick off one that's going to be a little injured or a little bit, you know, not as strong as the rest. So they, they follow the, the bait like that. But during the day and especially at night, they like to come into the boulder fields and they like to get easy meals and they like to stage up in, you know, the most the best current for the, or the best water temps for them and the, the best digesting, you know, phase for them. So they hang out in these, these, these rips. And the way that works is my favorite time is I really like an, in, I both are productive, but I really like an incoming tide. And what I like to do on that incoming tide is I like to have that bubble line or that, like the beginning of where that, the, the current is coming, kind of flooding in to this area be uh, like 30 feet, 20 feet ahead of me. And what happens is the bass are gonna hug the line, hug the, the rock, cause the rock is like a wall. And so when this bait gets pushed in here, if the bait is right here, and the, the this is kind of hard to explain, but if the bait is right here at the point of the rock, Okay, so we're looking at, I'm just trying to, it's easier if you're seeing what I'm doing, but if I'm, I'm trying to describe this for people that are listening. So if you're, so imagine a point, uh, you have a cove and it goes to a point and then there's kind of a cove or like a rock shelf 
or something on the other side. So you have a point. Uh, right at that point is where a lot of the bait is going to swim around and they're going to follow that line. It's the same thing the bass do. It's called like a fish highway. And a lot of the time you have this current that kind of you where the current is going to get sped up because it's going to gain speed and then it's going to hit something and deflect off. And what I like to do is find where it's going to get channeled in. So whether there be a big boulder there to help channel that current through a section or there be another like part of rock that's going to get channeled that's going to help condense that current and speed it up i like to be a little bit in from that rip because i think that a lot of the time the bass kind of set back a little bit so that they have the ability to push the bait up to the surface and push it against the wall and that's why they crush bait and i saw this in the spring i was standing up on the rocks looking down and i would see these big bass and they were cruising right up tight against the rock because they were waiting in that current line and they were waiting right for the for the in the most uh direct current that was uh coming through this area i really hope i'm describing this in a way that you guys can understand it makes sense in my head but i don't know if it's going to make sense to a lot of other people um so again, I'm going to, I'll describe this one more time, just in maybe a slightly different way. If you're not following me. Okay. So what happens is you have a point and you have on an incoming tide, the current is going to come. So obviously the tide has to, to come up. You have the, the, so what happens is it's going to fill up this area in order to fill up this area. It's has to come through other rock areas to fill up behind it. And so what happens is it's pulling water through a section. If that section is smaller, it's going to be faster current. Bass have bigger tails, obviously, and are built to be in current. So what they like to do is hang out in areas where the current is sped up a little bit, you know, where, you know, there's a little condensive areas. They also like areas where they can push bait to a spot where they can easily eat it. So they don't like working very hard in general to get food. So they like to push it up against either rock walls, stronger current. And uh, what they like to do is just really make it difficult for that bait fish to get away, hide in little shorter areas. Uh, and so in this scenario, um, which is all over Cape, I mean, there's hundreds of these little areas that are, you know, rippling in and out and you have tiny little points that are going to come down and there's hundreds of these. And a good amount of them are going to hold one or two bass from 35 to 45 inches. I mean, it's pretty common. Some of them are better than others. And some of them will hold bass depending on, it doesn't like you can get them 12 o'clock noon, but other places it's going to be five in the morning or, you know, seven 30 at night, the bass are going to be there. Uh, it has to be like either end of the day, but in, so for instance, though, we have this condensed area. So we have a cove and uh, there's some rocks here. What happens is the current is going to hit here and deflect off in kind of a, okay, let's do it like this. So say the current, the, all the water's coming in like this. As it comes by this point to go into the cur into the cove, what happens is it deflects off here and gets pushed out in a line. And that's where you can kind of see like there's, there might be some, surface disturbance where you'll be able to see that line of current, but it's also going to get flooded in here. And what's going to happen is back, maybe, you know, a little bit farther back on the, the rock, there's, it's going to be a little bit stronger current back there. Uh, and that's just because it's a little bit further along. So that, that water might get a little bit pushed in. If there's some boulders in here, it might be able to, you know, create some disturbance, create some little bit of different flows and kind of, make it uh tighter areas that the, the bass can sit in where the current's going to be sped up a little bit and if there's a bait fish it's going to go through that area a lot of the time the bass sit there and they wait and most of the time they're pretty deep and they they're looking and they're waiting and they're nosed into the current and then when you have your pencil come along you know up on the surface and they see this injured bait fish come over the top of them they come up and they crush it so hopefully that i describe i feel like that's a little bit easier to understand uh, and it's one of those things that I need to cr probably create a video on, on it just because I, I, I need to create a video on it just so you guys can really fully understand, uh, 
this because you need almost a diagram to really get this because it's very uh, I can talk about this all I want but there's I don't know if there's enough words to really describe how uh, intricate it is but once you figure this out and you'll see and if you really fish a lot uh, you'll probably have somewhat of somewhat of an idea of what I'm talking about if you fish a lot off of boulder fields but um if if you don't uh, and also rock cliffs. I mean, this is probably the same for, you know, Austin, Cape Ann, I'm sure Rhode Island as well. It's pretty similar uh, from what I've, I've seen images on Google Earth of, uh, I'm pretty sure like a lot of the same as very similar structure to Cape Ann on like Rhode Island. So if you've ever fished like, you know, Cape Ann or like Rhode Island, that's kind of the same deal as far as like the, the rock cliffs and the little points and coves that are gonna create a little bit more current. And if you even go on Google Earth, you'll be able to see these current lines. And that's where those be those big bass like to kind of sit a little bit far back in. A little bit, they're set like not far back, but like a few feet back, they're gonna be hanging out. And uh, that's where I kind of look and what I look for. Now, there's a whole other side of this that is wave sweep. And the wave sweep is gonna create the wall. And so the wall is very important. It's a fish highway on like the side, like it's really hard to see, but you know, the bass can't go through this. So this is a wall. Let's just say this is the rock wall is so I'm using my desk. Oh, I might be able to even use my microwave here <laughs> as a diagram. So if you guys are watching the video here, you'll probably be able to see this a little bit better, but say that this right here is the point, you know, we're standing right up on the point that there's you know, a rock wall going back this way and a rock face going back this way. When the current comes along this wall, it's gonna get deflected off a little bit like that. But it has to fill up this area because say that it's a cove and there's like another section, like say there's two microwaves you know, facing each other right here and it's creating this little V cup. What's gonna happen is the water is gonna start filling up in here. There's gonna be bass, so you have that current break that's gonna hit and go like this and then it's gonna kind of push in. If you have a rock that's like right about here, it's gonna create a faster channel where the water is gonna be able to get sped up. And a lot of the time that's where the bass will be sitting. So hopefully if you're watching the video, you'll be able to see that. It's a little bit better of, a, of like a, a diagram so that you guys can kind of understand what I'm talking about. Uh, and it's very important because that's gonna be really productive. And I'm sure people are gonna be upset that I'm, I'm sharing the this because this is, it's. It's really crazy because um, it it's it's so true, and I think people don't take it take tides and uh, moon phases for granted in wind direction. And so what happens is sometimes if you have an offshore wind, it's gonna blow this this rip thing instead of it being very uh, directly across here, it's gonna end up blowing it so it kind of goes like that, and then it's gonna be this it's gonna slow the current way down. The current has to come through here, but it's just gonna slow everything down, and so. Uh, it's not going to be as effective. If you have a strong onshore wind here, it's going to make it even a harder angle and it's going to increase that current. Uh, and then say you have a wave and a wave is coming in and it's crashing and it's rolling through this area, it's going to increase that speed even more. So there's different things that are going to affect it differently that's going to make the fishing either better or worse. Um, and current generally, the more current, current you have, the better it's going to be. And uh, I found that when you don't even need any of this rock structure, yes, this helps a lot. But say you have, um, you don't have that rock wall, that oh, like stiff rock wall, and you just have, um, you just have like, like some boulders, you know, out in the water, and you have some waves that are crashing onto those boulders, and you can see that they're crashing and they're rolling and they're kind of kind of rolling out this way, and the current, the rip from the waves or the wave sweep is crashing here and it's rolling and turning and going out this way. That's gonna create a wall of current and the bass are gonna sit on the outside of that or where all that current's getting dumped out. And so they're gonna sit here and they're gonna wait for that bait fish to get pushed in. This is a different scenario. These bass are actively feeding where in this scenario, depending on how strong the current is, those bass are just hanging out because they use it. Like if you can imagine how like, like uh, they, an easy way for them to get oxygen into their into them and an easy way for them to sit there and not have to be constantly moving to get that oxygen into them is them to nose into current 
keep their pectoral fins, you know, almost like a bird does in the air when it's kind of hovering and just slowly move its tail. And I'm not talking about they're going like this, like crazy, you know, moving their tail back and forth. I'm talking about they're probably literally torquing their tail. Like, you know how I, it's kind of hard to describe, but what they'll do is they'll kind of like, like a, almost like a bird's wing. They'll move their tail like this and it'll just create enough, you know, force that they'll just hang out perfectly streamlined into the current because they're all very, you know, then like water. Oh my God. I'm blanking on so many vocab words right now. It's killing me. But, um, they, they sit in the water and they face nose into the current cause they're hydrodynamic. There you go. And, uh, they just nose into the current and they just hang out and they digest their food. And that's not an active feeding state where when they're in those areas where all the water is getting dumped out into the, um, from the wave sweep, that's them actively feeding. And, or if they're in that current, right where those waves are crashing, that's actively feeding. They're waiting for a bait fish to get disturbed and blown into them. And they're feeding like they would be on a bunker school. That's them. And they're tend to be more aggressive and more frothed up because they're in those current, in the current, in those, in the waves are a lot of white water going, you know, they're getting good oxygen. So the bass tend to be a little bit more aggressive. So in this scenario, you have the, uh, the, the waves coming through this area and, uh, dumping out. And what happens is those bass will sit where just at outside of where the, the wave crashing. So the waves are crashing, they're blowing through this area and they're coming out and where they dump out, that's where the bass are going to be nosed into that wave sweep, waiting for the bait fish that got picked up and thrown, you know, and tumbled in the surf and then washed out into the bass. And they're right there to eat those bait fish. And there you can easily sit there all day and crush bait as it gets blown into them. Okay. So that's an interesting spot because it's not going to be necessarily huge waves coming through. And it's fine if there are waves coming you know, there's wave sweep and then there's waves crashing here and also blowing into that's fine. So what you do is you work your pencil in to that wave sweep and generally you have big bass come up and crush it. So one day that I, I said that I really had this good feeling. Uh, it, this was even later in the year. This is later in the fall. And uh, I'm sitting there out on my rock with my yellow pencil and it is just pouring rain and the wind's blowing. There's big surf. And I was just, you know, I was like, man, this is just some real surf casting right here. And I wasn't fully expecting to catch a big fish, although I saw what was going on here. We had some waves. There's a little rock line, some boulders here, and the waves were crashing in, rolling, kind of bouncing off this, these rocks that were right here and kind of pushing the wave sweep out this way. So I go and go to a spot and I, I cast out right over that wave sweep and I'm bringing it back through the wave sweep. And there's big waves coming in, they're crashing and they're rolling into that area too, but less frequently than they are over here. And I'm working my pencil in and I'm like, man, you know, it's pouring and the rain's going and just crushing me. And I'm like, man, it would be so awesome if I hooked into a fish right here. And I'm working my pencil in this bass leaps out of the water. I'm like, oh my God, he comes in again. And I'm like, come on, eat it. And then it crushes the thing, my drag screaming. And what happened is a wave crashed, a huge wave, crash, like monstrous wave crashed onto my line, created a little bit of slack in my line. And when it snapped tight, the fish got off, shook its head. And when it snapped tight, it just gave it a little slack in my line and it came off. And that happens. And I had to happen to me twice that year where I had good bend in my line, but then when it maybe had a little bit of seaweed on it, I was, I'm not entirely sure. But when that wave crushed, it just, what happened was, is it just, it, pushed my line down and then it snapped up and it was just all loose and the fish got off. And I was very devastated when that happened uh, because I was really hoping that I could uh, catch that fish because it was just, it was a big, big bass. Thankfully, a few days later, a few days later, a day later, I went back out. It was a little less crazy. It was actually sunny out and there's this little gut in the wave sweep was still doing the same thing. You have actively feeding bass where the waves are crashing and they're coming into this area. They're bouncing off a few rocks and it's pushing current out and through that. So those bass are nosing the current actively feeding. When you have a bass like that, that's actively feeding, the best thing you can do 
is put something with a lot of vibration and a lot of action above its head. And in our, in our instance, we were throwing pencils and we brought it right in front of its head. It was big, it was thrashing around. And the interesting thing was, it was too choppy in that area to work a spook, especially a big spook. It was just too choppy too. So to work a small pencil, it worked absolutely perfectly. I had eight fish, eight fish that were like all cookie cutter. I don't know if it was quite eight. It was maybe six or seven, but it was it was a lot of really big fish, and uh, they they're all like forty to forty two inches. Um, and I was just having a lot of fun. I actually even threw a Danny plug through it and was catching fish using the Danny plug as well. But you know, you have that same wave sweep and the bass are sitting there and that works for everything. But I really like throwing pencils during the day. You can even fish that stuff at night. It's the same deal. If you want to fish a, like a darter, for example, you can fish it right in those rips where the current is getting strong and those bass will be there. So it, not necessarily pencils, but these are the way that I like to work pencils and the way I can, I have a lot of photos of large bass during the day. And, and people were asking me in the middle of the year, they're like, how are you catching them? You know, like it doesn't matter on the moon phase. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary to me because I didn't even know the fishing was this good during the day. I was really turned on to it this year for daytime fishing. Um, I did a lot of my fishing at night. I did 90% of my fishing at night. I fished 10% of the time during the day. And then I was told I was being very, very stupid because in those same areas I was catching good bass during the day, there were the same fish were still there. It's just, you got to figure out how to catch them because those bass are not really going anywhere, especially off of our cliffs that you can have a 30 foot drop right off of those, uh, those rocky cliffs. So those bass will still be down there hanging out. Uh, and they feel perfectly safe to be there during the day. It's just, how do you get those bass to come up in and nose up into the current? So then the other thing that I was told and the other thing that, you know, I, I really do believe now is spooks tend to do really well when there's, when bass have competition. So when there's more than one bass going after the same bait, uh, they, they really like to, spooks are a really good way to get them to react. When there's a singular big bass down there, pencil poppers do a better job of getting that bass to react than a spook does. And I don't know, really know why. And I, I, I mean, obviously there's better, um, more vibrations coming off of a pencil popper than a spook. Spooks do have, in my opinion, more realistic looking uh, action to them than a pencil popper does. But I found that, you know, and I was told uh, that they tend to do very uh, well when there's singularly large bass down there. And I've had that happen many times you know, instances as well. There's one in particular where I was looking at that, that line of water and I, I was fishing spooks and I was not getting a single hit on the spook. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw in a pencil. You know, it was glass come water. It was early in the morning. It was probably six or seven in the morning, early in the morning, but, but it was pretty early in the morning. And, uh, the, uh, I worked the spook right over that line. And literally once it hit that little line, and I'm not saying never try to go and cast past the, the line of current because they generally are going to start in that line of current. And I found that most of the time they're like 30 feet back from that, but they'll be right on that line. And in this instance, as soon as the thing hit that little bubble line of water or where the current was getting pushed off of the, the rock, boom, it just got hammered. And this bass jumped eight feet in the air, not eight feet in the air, but it was so high. It probably jumped five feet in the air and uh, it did a whole backflip. And it was, it was such a big fish that it had to be pretty high in the air because it did a whole big backflip and landed in the water. And I, I ended up landing this bass it was probably 44 or 45 inches. And as I was reeling that bass in, there was a bass that was probably eight inches longer than it following it in, which is mind boggling because that bass was 45 inches. The bass following it was like 53 inches. It was literally touching the other bass nose to tail, but the tail of that other bass was another like eight inches longer. And uh, I'm not going to be that guy trying to like, <laughs> like weigh or measure the bass through the water. But if the bass that I caught was in that mid 40 inch range, that bass was high forties, if not into the, you know, low 50 inch range. I mean, it was a big fish. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, I guess, competition based, but it was the only bass that I caught. And generally in those instances, if you're catching a bass that's being that aggressive and coming out of the water like that, maybe there was 
uh, competition, but also maybe it was the only one that saw it and it came up and crushed it because it was by itself. And then a bass 15 feet away from it saw that this bass struggling and wanted to go eat the plug out of its mouth. And I didn't end up catching another bass that whole trip. So in that scenario, uh, yeah, I, I honestly believe that the, uh, the, the pencil was calling a bass that I was fishing spooks in that hole. I probably casted two dozen times with a Magnum Walker in that spot and didn't have it come up. So to have the pencil just immediately first cast, get that reaction from the pencil, it's pretty uh, unequivocal to me that that bass was definitely um, by itself and not feeding aggressively. And when it saw the pencil, it just came up and crushed it. Um, and yeah, so then I guess the other thing I really wanted to talk about is the pencil poppers that I use and I use really, I have some bigger ones, I guess I'll bring this guy down too. And I like white, so I guess the three colors I, I really like fishing, we'll bring them down here for pencils, uh, is my number one favorite, my number one favorite bar none is a yellow over white. I mean, if I can get a plug if I can get a pencil popper, period, I'm going to get it in yellow over white. If I can't, and there's either white or there's bunker, those are going to be my my next two choices. But yellow over white is really good. So this is a Pumba plugs, or it's a small Pumba plug pencil popper. Uh, and this might have a name change soon, but for now, this is what it's called. And uh, it's about a six inch plug. And I have an owner ST66. It's like four X strong. So it's like the big hook on here. And you can see this is a pretty big hook, but I actually trimmed the, the tail off of this teaser. So I put a little bit bigger hook to give it a little bit more weight. It's a very uh, buoyant wood. So um, having the, the bigger hook is going to not only help a little bit with the casting distance, because I like a lighter plug, because I don't necessarily need to cast too far with these plugs to get into the, the zone. A lot of the time, I'm honestly just, I'm catching those bass like on a, on a, maybe a, 30 40 foot cast so i'm not casting that far i'm probably casting you know i don't even know like maybe one quarter of the distance i could all right i i could i guess with this plug i i don't really know but anyway yeah i'm not casting that far regardless that's all that you really need to know so i put i don't unlike i like plugs that are going to be up on the surface and really thrash around hard and create a big disturbance i personally like to work my plugs where when I'm working it, it's going pretty much all the way to one side and then all the way back to the other. And that is going to throw so much water and get that bass's attention. And that's what I'm really looking for. That's why I like having a lighter plug in the, the Puma plug. Uh, the small Puma pencil is just amazing. You know, it, it just does that beautifully. It just thrashes up the surface of the water and it just calls these enormous bass up to crush on and i've i fished all sorts of different plugs and i'll get into a few here that are plastic that i i use and um they're they're good but they just don't produce like this does and so yellow over white in the puma plug you know is pretty good so these are the three sizes of puma pencil if you guys don't know we got the small medium large uh i don't exactly know the exact sizes on these so i'm not even gonna really attempt but this is like five or six i believe this is a six inch pencil and so this is like seven inches and then this is like an eight inch pencil so it's pretty big but uh i i caught i've caught nice bass on all three of these uh, i don't like going this large personally if you're not fishing in like the cape cod canal this would kill in the canal but if you're not fishing in the cape cod canal i i don't see a scenario where i'd want to go this big but uh i mean maybe if the bass are going like absolutely nutty, like they were that during the story that I told first, like if it was a day like that, I could see you getting away with throwing a plug that big. And maybe you would actually call the biggest bass out of there by throwing it. But uh, I wouldn't throw, I wouldn't start by throwing that, put it that way. Okay. And so another plug that I really like is the Tsunami Talking Popper. This is the small Tsunami Talking Popper. Two years ago, I had a few large bass on this exact plug. Last year, I didn't really throw this very much. But uh, two years ago, I had two bass that were like 42 inches on this. So same deal, same like following the current line. These things cast well, they're plastic, they're really pretty inexpensive. The other one I really like is the uh, 
cotton cordell and this one i i, th I throw a decent amount um i've seen some 45 inch bass caught on this uh, i personally haven't caught a really big bass on this plug but my brother has uh and uh yeah it was it was a bass to remember really early spring and it just came up and annihilated this it was early early june so uh yeah i mean another really inexpensive plug very loud we we love that noise in certain scenarios and uh sometimes it is what you really talk about a plug that thrashes up the surface uh the this is one of those plugs that really thrashes up the surface like like crazy and it's very productive when the bass are when it's calm water but also if you can get away and it's not too windy and not too choppy and uh but you have some big surf and you want to get those bass to notice your plug is there it's not a bad plug to throw on when you have some big surf and pounding waves but it's pretty flat common gent like it's big swells i guess is like when i would be throwing that okay so then we'll get to the rod and i have one rod that i really above all else like to throw pencils on and uh it's the gsb skinner and i'm getting an where is it i'm getting the uh the gsb skinner is um the uh is a nine foot two rod and the reason i like nine foot two rods for pencil for really fishing off the rocks is just because uh that back cast when i go to cast if you you know put the rod behind you and you have a cliff behind you you're gonna smack the, the tip of your rod and crack the tip of your rod off but uh with an if you have like a 10 foot rod rather you you might crack the tip of your rod it doesn't happen all the time there's many scenarios where that wouldn't but if you have anything over 10 feet so this is a little bit easier to work in that scenario it is a, a moderate like a it's a moderate action rod uh, so that means that if you have a really stiff wind in your face, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to control the tip of your rod because it might be doing a little bit side to side action as well as forwards action. That's when I might go to the, the carbon surf series of rods. They have a 10, six, uh, three, four, uh, two, uh, three ounces. That is a really awesome pencil popping rod as well. So, uh, or the 10 foot is good as well, but I am getting a, uh, GSB 101 uh ml which is gonna be pretty much this rod exactly but just the 10 foot version of this rod and the reason i'm, I'm wanting that rod so badly and I'm so excited about getting that rod is just because it's going to be able to get a little bit extra casting distance for beaches but i think it's going to be a really fun rod to throw pencils on too so uh the gsb series rods are my favorite bar none for pencil popping period but there are certain scenarios if you have a wind that's over 40 and it's blowing straight into your face it can get a little tough if you're not used to working uh, pencils. So if you're new to the game, to working pencils, it can be a little difficult. Uh, otherwise, this rod is such a good pencil popping rod. It is unbelievable. I mean, it, the casting distance is perfect. Like, you, you, there's no problem. And it, and it casts that this size of a uh, pencil. So that like six inch size pencil is my favorite size to throw. It's like perfect. It's that, you know, what is it? Half ounce to three ounces on this no it's one to three ounces on this so this is uh uh like two ounces even uh and so it's like perfect it's sweet spot you know you have a the sweet spot and uh you can really bomb the cast out there and it just is perfect for working it it's a small enough rod as well where you can really you, like you can slow down your the, the pencil and speed it up and very controlled you have a lot of control on this as well as when the bass grab you know grabs your plug it's a shorter rod and so there's less that needs to load up on your hook sets not that you really need to go crazy but uh you can you get a lot of feedback it's a lighter rod i, I mean I, I could go on and on and the other thing that i really like is the grip on this rod as well i'm a huge fan of this i know a lot of people don't like it because it falls apart a little bit but um these grips are absolutely phenomenal, in my opinion. Really good when your hands are wet. It's a good eeling rod as well, but that's the rod that I really like for pencil popping. I've done a lot of pencil popping with it, and I would suggest that rod to anyone that fishes on Cape Ann or Rhode Island or anywhere that has some rocks behind you and you really don't want to uh, snap the tip of your rod off of with it. But the other really awesome thing about that rod is it's small enough that you can fight schoolies like bass from 20 to... 30 inches that are going to be really fun on that rod and uh it's just it's just such a again like oh my god it's such a fun rod and i am absolutely itching like you wouldn't believe to get out and get into some 
some really solid bass this season. Pencil popping is going to be one of my favorite things to do this season. I like, it's just gonna, it's going to be, if I, like the season doesn't really begin for me until I get a bass on a pencil. I know I'll probably get my first bass or first few bass on uh, some soft plastics, maybe some spooks, but until I'm getting a, like a, a good solid pencil popping bite, uh, I don't really count my season going until that happens. So, I mean, if you guys uh, really want a solid pencil to try, I highly suggest the Pumba Plugs, uh, small six inch yellow over white pencil popper. Uh, and it's just, it's a beast of a plug, you know, and I've had, I've had bass of all sizes on it. Some really, I've had, you know, the upper end, you know, I've had bass up to 48 inches on it. And then I've had bass all the way down to like 10 inches on it. So you'd be surprised on a, on a pencil of that size, what it does. It generally calls bigger fish than you'd think. Uh, and uh, I think that most people get caught up with throwing bigger plug, like too big a pencil popper for big bass. And I honestly believe that. I think that people get in their head, they're like, okay, if I want to catch a big bass, I'm going to throw a, a giant plug. And I honestly believe when a bass is looking up at the thing and it's thrashing around on the surface, this is going to be not too intimidating and look roughly the same size as a lot of the bunker and stuff that they feed on. Uh, and so is uh, the medium size for that matter. It's just going to look like a big bunker to them. But uh, then the, the big size is going to look monstrous and yeah in certain scenarios when they're like i want a big prey item uh they're gonna go after it but i'm such a big uh you know fan of throwing those you know smaller but not too small pencils and i really think that it's going to be productive and i said i know a lot of guys that did really well last season on uh five six inch pencils i mean really it's it's the way to go uh especially on cape ann and i i hope this kind of helped you guys a little bit on uh learning kind of what I like to look for, for like large bass during the daytime. I know it's a very, uh, it's a very specific and very uh, kind of hard to describe for me. And I hope that you guys were able to actually kind of understand what I was saying, because I, I totally understand that it's, it's, it's one of those things that you don't really know you're doing the right thing until you've had repetition in doing it. And it took me a while to really learn that that's why that is, that's why the fish are doing what they're doing. I thought tide didn't matter. You know, I was on the, the opinion of, okay, it's like, okay, if m these boulders are exposed there and whenever those boulders were exposed, I was actually catching fish when that's not even the case. They're there the whole tide, as long as you have that current going through and the wind is super, super effective too. Cause I'd go out there and be like, ah, oh, the wind doesn't really matter if it's West or East or whatever. But the, uh, but it makes all the difference a lot of the time because what happens is the uh, the wind's either going to blow the tide the the rip out or in, and that's when it's really important to uh, know what the tide's going to be doing in in those different scenarios. So uh, I think that that's something that to really keep in mind and actually look for that and see if you can notice that when you're fishing a point. Um, and you can see that, oh, there is that little bubble line that's going across there. Huh. That's what he was talking about. And so, and then really picking that apart and sometimes it's straight, sometimes it's, but you'll see with the wind, like it'll blow it around a little bit. And so hopefully you guys actually be able to, are actually able to understand that and really understand, uh, what I'm saying. And, uh, I hope that it makes some sense. And I hope that looking for those boulders that, that might create or that the rock line, that cliff line that might create that spot where the current is really hitting that and speeding up. Uh, looking for that stuff is going to really be productive for you. Uh, and uh, I I think that's pretty much it for me. I, I think that I described that as best I could and I really hope you guys enjoy listening to this podcast. I'm glad that we're back. I'm glad I was able to get that podcast out and uh, I'm super looking forward to this next season. We are a few weeks out. And uh, if you have any suggestions, suggestions or questions, please comment below uh, and like and subscribe. We're going to have some crazy uh, content this summer, more podcasts, awesome stories. I hope this helped and uh, I hope this is going to help you this season and kind of understand more about what you're looking at uh, and what you should be looking at. So thank you guys for listening and watching this podcast and I'll see you next time.